Hello again. Today we're going to be talking about gene set enrichment analysis as originally um, applied by the Broad Institute. So gene set enrichment analysis takes a look at big biological data, things like microarray, RNA-seq, methylation patterns, etc. And when scientists, particularly biologists, generate this data in the laboratory, uh, they're generally not well versed in statistics. So they analyze these data sets by looking at one gene at a time. So for example, if I have a microarray data set up here, I will have rows which have items. In this case, they're probes. These could be gene symbols. These could be pathways, etc. We also are going to have samples per column. You want to make sure that your experimental samples are towards the front and you collect your control samples towards the back. It just makes the statistics easier. And of course, you need your data. So what scientists will do when they generate this is they'll compare one group to another group statistically via single gene analysis like the T's test. That will then give you a list of T scores with associated P value. Now the scientists will look at this long list and determine which genes are statistically significant, but this doesn't necessarily take biology into context. If we replicate this experiment, for example, and do the same approach, we may have two lists of genes that don't overlap. And the alternative problem is that this could miss pathway effects. So for example, several genes could change very slightly but their cumulative effect on the cell can be much greater than one gene that changes quite a bit. So the idea here is rather than looking at a single gene analysis, we want to look at a genome-wide approach. And gene set enrichment analysis algorithm allows us to do that. It calculates an enrichment score for an entire gene set rather than individual genes. And it's more reliable because those gene sets are knowledge-based. So for example, genes within a pathway. And this will keep biology in the context of what we're trying to examine. So then using our example micro, um, microarray data set, we're first going to use those single gene statistics to create a reference signature. Now a reference signature is a ranked list of items from high expression to low expression. And you can use any user defined statistic uh, within GSEA, or if you want to do your own, you're more than welcome to. Um, T-test is a very popular one. And so, for example, if I take my microarray data here and I run t-test, I'm going to get a list with t-scores. And if I rank it, that becomes my reference signature. I'm then going to compare that reference signature to the query gene set. Now, the query gene set is an unranked list of items, but we do have to use the same type of item. So if I have probes in my reference signature, I have to have probes within my query gene set. Um, we can also use uh, target genes, for example. These could be genes that have come from the tail of another study's reference signature. So in that way, we could compare two reference signatures to each other. We could also take this in terms of a biological pathway, say Keg or Patrick. And so in that case, we would have a list of, in this case, probes associated with a pathway. And basically how GSEA handles this is it walks down the reference signature asking, does this gene match any in my query gene set? If it does not, it's considered a miss. And we're going to decrease the running enrichment score seen in this green line here by a constant that relates to the number of items in the reference signature along with the number of items within the specific query gene set. If, as I'm walking, I find a hit or a match between my item in the reference signature and my item in the query gene set, I then will add the T-score um, to my, or I should say a T-score variant, to my enrichment score. And so in this way, we can weight a gene based on its phenotypic difference as seen by that user-defined statistic, in this case, the T-test. 
So looking at my little example here, my first one was a miss, so my enrichment score goes down. Then I have two rather significant hits, so you see that I start to go up. And then I have some misses, so then I start to go down. Here's my other hit. But notice my other hit isn't as significant as my uh, first two, so I don't go quite as high. Miss, 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 so you get the idea. So the idea here is that this colored line is my reference signature, and I can see genes within it listed below here. And um, the red is for overexpression. The purple or blue is for underexpression. And the lines here are my query gene set. And wherever you see a line, this is where I have a hit. So we can then define a leading edge. The leading edge are the genes that are hits and between zero and my maximum enrichment score, meaning that these genes contribute the most to the enrichment score signal. They may have some relevance. So then how is p-value calculated? Well, we have our reference signature here, which is my list of items ranked by my uh, T-score in this case. And since I didn't have very many samples, I only had three per group, I'm going to do a gene set per mutation. So what that means is that I am shuffling the probes within my reference signature, keeping my score um, in the proper line. So notice all of a sudden I've shuffled these genes, but now I have the same scores ranked from high to low. This then becomes one of my random reference signatures, and it would then be compared to the same query gene set that we saw on the prior slide. Do this analysis about a thousand times, and then you can get a null distribution of the random uh, reference signatures. So then you get the idea that some of my values are going to be negative, some of them are going to be positive. Right here, this dotted line represents my true enrichment score. So you get the idea. I can calculate the nominal p-value here by taking the number of enrichment scores that are equal to or above my true enrichment score, so basically the number frequency in this range, and then I'm going to divide that by the total number of uh, randomized reference signatures with the same sign as my true um, enrichment score. So, for example, all my positive ones at this end. And then if I needed to do it for the negative tail, I could do the same thing on the negative tail. So using this randomization, we can also calculate a normalized enrichment score, which is very handy for being able to compare multiple gene sets to each other. It gets rid of any effects that might occur due to differing sizes of the gene sets, because as we discussed earlier, um, those constants are important for calculating your enrichment score. So this is the same um, plot that we saw earlier, the randomized um, enrichment scores, so this is my null, here's my trues, my dotted line. And so to calculate the normalized enrichment score for a particular query gene set, I'm going to take the true enrichment score for that gene set, and I'm going to divide it by the mean of all the random gene um, enrichment scores with the same sign as my true enrichment score. So for example, from zero up to one, you can see we have all these um, within the distribution. So we would add, or sorry, actually, we would actually average the values here for my denominator. And then similarly, I could do the same thing on the negative tail as well. So hopefully this gives you some understanding of the values that GSEA calculates and why we use them in our research. Please let me know if you have any questions and have a great day.